This teaching series began when a friend of mine said to me, Hey, Pastor, some time back you said that someday you would do a whole series on how to hear God's voice. I said, yeah, you're right. And they said, well, I know that it's your uh, process every six months to go spend three or four days in fasting and prayer alone with God and to ask him to reveal to you six months of teaching for our church. And I said, yeah, it is. And he said, I know that you're going to do that this coming week because you said you were. I said, yeah, you're right. He said, well, I, w- I would like to ask you to take that idea of how to hear God's voice and to pray over that with God this week. Would you do that for me? I said, absolutely. So I went upstairs, I wrote it down, and I took it along with all, all these other ideas to pray over. And as I sat with God... And started with how to teach people to hear his voice. By the way, Jesus said in John chapter 10, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then he said this, my sheep know my voice. Wow, that actually means that everyone who chooses to follow Jesus should be able to decipher and distinguish the voice of Jesus in their life. And then I thought, how much training have I ever given followers of Jesus for how to hear God's voice? How to hear the voice of Jesus? So as I was praying about this and what what that would look like, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, well, what I want is not just that they would hear my voice. I actually want them to also talk to me so I can hear their voice. I want there to be an actual conversation with me, some personal engagement. So I scratched out how to hear God's voice, and I wrote down how to have a conversation with God. Got a little richer, a little deeper. And I was just getting ready to dive into that. And then I I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying to me, oh no, there's a level deeper than that. I don't want to just have conversations. I actually want to have companionship that involves all these conversations. So I crossed out how to have a conversation with God and I wrote down divine companionship. Now, if you're going to be friends with anybody, you have to begin by having some sort of basic understanding of who they are, how they work, what their nature is. You don't have to know tons of detail, but you at least have to know something. I was, I was visiting with a couple of our younger kids that are in Next Gen this morning And somebody said to me, hey, Pastor Ron, come over here. I think you're going to like these kids. I said, well, I already do like them, but why would I like them more? And they said, well, they're really big into car racing. (laughs) Now, for those of you who know me well, I'm a bit of a grease monkey. I have driven lots of muscle cars in my life. I love drag races, I love circle track racing, NASCAR, NHRA, I I like the whole thing, all right? I know, that's kind of weird, right? By the way, guys that dress in pastel don't like those things, have you noticed? (laughs) I'm wearing pastel because everybody in Next Gen is wearing pastel, and I so agree with what they're doing in there. Can we have a hand for the people that work in Next Gen? It's huge. So now what these people knew about these kids and me is that if we were going to have a relationship, it had to start with an understanding of something that was important in both of our lives. We had to have an understanding of each other. Last Sunday, if you were not here, I, or you were not tuned in online, I want to encourage you to go to our website and pull up the teaching from last Sunday. Pastor Bill Funk was here. And he did a great job of laying out for us 
the nature of God that makes him want to have companionship with us. It was phenomenal teaching. I want to encourage you to go and, and listen to it. Today, we're going to go a little bit deeper because oftentimes, as I deal with followers of Jesus, there's a lot of confusion about this thing called the will of God. Understanding the will of God. And I think oftentimes we start with a basic assumption. Diva did such a great job of alluding to it today. Thank you, Diva. When she said, understanding Diva's will, shouldn't that be in there somewhere? You see, we all have this default setting that there's this thing that I want, and then there's this thing that God's, God wants, and they're not the same. And then in order to get what God wants, I have to give up what I want. Now, I won't lie to you, because there are certain things that you and I want that are not good for us. Have you noticed that? I want donuts every day. My doctor says, don't touch them. <laughs> That's just how it goes, right? Yeah. And yet, my doctor and I actually want the same thing. Because more than I want donuts, I want a healthy and robust life. And that's what my doctor wants for me as well. So, I want to take some of the mystery, if I can out of this understanding the will of God. And let's start with, with sort of a surprise. Take a look on the screen. If, if we want to understand God's will, we kind of need to cross out will and put way. Because if we understand God's way, how God actually works, it's, very, it's a whole lot easier than to find out what God actually wants. Because God's will and God's way are inseparably tied together. But in order to find that out, we have to begin to connect another word with this concept, and it's the word purpose. Because God's will and God's way is inseparably tied to and wrapped up in God's purpose for us. And if you want a challenging exercise, take a blank piece of paper and a pencil and write down in one sentence, God's purpose for you. I hope that by the end of this teaching this morning, you can. And you think, well, doesn't that vary from person to person? No, not at the basic level. It's always the same. So we're going to take a look at that. But in order to understand that, we need to understand a principle, and here it is on the screen, and that is God's way is best understood in the context of a parent-child relationship. I want to take you back to the last time you went to the optometrist, your eye doctor to, to if you're under 16, you may probably never have been, but if you're an old duffer like me, you've been along a lot of times, all right? And they put you in that chair, and then they bring that machine up to you that's got these two big round things, and they twist the little buttons on the side that bring up different lenses, and they say, Mr. Hunt, can, would you read the bottom line for me? And if you all go, I can't read it, they'll turn it. Can you read it now? Can you read it now? Can you read it now? And when you can finally read it, then they go back one and say, which one of these is better, that one, this one, or the next one? Everybody's been through that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's the interesting thing about God's will. It's really fuzzy and hard to bring into focus until we put the right lens on. And when we put the right lens on, suddenly everything starts to come into focus. It's my observation that the confusion around God's will happens when we see God as God and us as human beings. 
So God has this thing he wants for us and we have this thing that we want for us. And it's a tussle between what I as a human being want and what God as the divine ruler of the world wants. And it's because we're not looking through the right lens. Those of you who are parents, what do you want for your children? I have a pretty good idea. And it actually doesn't vary from child to child. It's the same. You want them to grow healthy and to mature. And you want them to grow wise and strong in life, correct? And you want them to learn how to make good decisions and to avoid as much as possible needless heartache. What would happen if those are the exact same things God wants for us? You see, what does God want for us? Well, good. fortunately, we don't have to guess. He put it right in the Bible. Let's go read it. Here it is. Peter writes about it. And he said, now listen, do your best to add these things to your lives. To your faith, add goodness. To goodness, add knowledge. To knowledge, add self-control. To self-control, add patience. To patience and add ser service for God. <clears throat> to your service for God, add kindness for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And to kindness, add love. Is that a good list? Yeah. That's an awesome list. Whoa, pull over to the side of the road for a minute. I'm about ready to shake up your theology. Are you ready? Yeah. Do you notice an almost complete lack of a focus on obedience there? None of those is about obeying what God says. They're all about personal growth and development. That's huge. That's actually what God wants. This is where I might shake up your theology a little bit. And I don't have time to go through scripture and prove it to you. But to Jesus and the followers of Jesus, obedience, simple obedience, was always accompanied with childish faith. Not childlike faith, that's good. Childish faith, immature faith. Obedience was always where faith begins, but it was never the goal of faith. The goal of faith was always the transformation of the human spirit, not compliance with the rules of God. Friends, that's huge. That's massive. Because we think God's will is that I would obey him. We fundamentally misunderstand how God works. And we fundamentally misunderstand who we're supposed to be. So, answer for me this question. Those of you who have had 16-year-old sons and daughters. If every day your 16-year-old came to you and said to you, Mom and Dad, I love you so much. I trust you so much. Just tell me. First of all, they would have to revive you, right? <laughs> After they revived you and they went on to say, I trust you so much. If you would just make a list of things for me to do today, all I want to do is whatever you want me to do. You would go, I would take that for two days, right? <laughs> and yet, you would realize that if your child did that every day, your child would never grow and would never mature and would never learn how to think on his or her own and would never learn how to make decisions and would never grow strong and would never be resilient and would never know how to build a life of their own because all they wanted to do was whatever you told them to do. Hello. We come to God. Oh God, I love you so much. All I want to do is whatever you want me to do. You tell me to do it, I'll do it. And we think that's how God's will works. 
That's not actually how God's will works. God wants us to add to our faith goodness. It doesn't mean he won't help us with it, but you have to understand that your purpose in life is to build your life. Not with sheer guts and determination, but in divine companionship and partnership with God. But make no mistake about it, at the end of the day, it is not God's responsibility to build your life. It's yours. Did you notice how quiet it got in here? It's, it's actually true. Now, after Peter says, look, faith and goodness and knowledge and self-control. By the way, are any of these easy? Anybody here find self-control easy? No, it's hard. Every one of these are difficult. They all take place in the crucible of challenge. But if we will add all these things to us, I want you to see what Peter says next. Take a look. If all these things, not some of these things, not the ones that you like and are more easy for you, if all these things are in you and are what? What's the next word? Growing. Growing. This is not a destination. This is a journey and they're growing, they will help you be useful and productive. Does that sound good? That's what we want, right? Useful and productive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you put all this together and a bunch of other things, here's what you come up with. This is what God wants for us. God wants his children to grow, develop, and mature into loving, strong, and wise people who build their own lives around solid, healthy, unselfish, and eternally truthful principles. There it is in one sentence. Right there. That's what God wants for every one of us. If I'm going to quote Bill Funk from last Sunday... You could take a picture of that. It took me a while to write that. It's good. That is what we have to understand if we want to understand God's will. Because there's this little thing in us that I call our hope. Take a look. And our hope is this. If I couple faith and I trust God for my salvation and I get on board and I become a Jesus follower and I obey him good enough, I'm going to end up living a charmed life. That comes through to me all the time. A guy who was just here last Sunday, and I'm not picking on him. He's a great guy. But he was, last Sunday, he said to me, Pastor Ron, I was an atheist for many years. I said, really? What led to that? He said, my mom got diagnosed with ALS and she died. And I said to myself, what kind of a God would do that? He didn't realize it. But what he was saying to me is that his faith taught him that if I have faith and I obey, I will live a charmed life and none of those bad things will ever happen to me. God will make sure of it. Huh. You see, what he was really saying is this next statement. And that is we hope and expect to live in a bubble of unbrokenness in a broken world. And in order to understand this whole concept of brokenness and unbrokenness, I put together a chart. So let's throw the chart up here. And on the left side is the unbroken world. And internally, we all have a feeling this is how life is supposed to work. And I have some good news. Eventually, in the new heavens and the new earth, that's exactly how it's going to work. And so here's internally kind of what we think. In an unbroken world, life is fair should be. In an unbroken world, good people should prosper and bad people should struggle. Don't we all kind of have that idea on the inside? I know you don't want to shake your head, but it is true. I know. Okay. Number three, in a, in a, in a, in a unbroken world, good people don't get ill or at least not seriously ill and bad people do. And in an unbroken world, when, when good people get ill, they get healed. 
And in an unbroken world, when bad people get ill, they struggle and they don't get healed. In an unbroken world, good people live comfortably. Life is not hard for them. In an unbroken world, bad people struggle and life is always hard for them. In an unbroken world, good people die old and in their sleep, by the way. <laughs> Preferably. Right? And bad people die young and miserable. And in an unbroken world, the good are protected by God from Satan being able to come against them. But bad people are not protected. I just want to start by saying... If I or anybody from this church has ever conveyed any of those concepts to you as if they should be part of your life here, I am so sorry. It's just not true. Because from the front of the Bible to the back of the Bible, on page after page, throughout Jesus' entire ministry, one thing was very, very clear, and it is said without any caveats or equivocation or anything else, and that is, you and I live in a broken world. That's really clear. And by the way, when something is broken, it does not work like it's supposed to, correct? That's why we call it broken. So how do things work in our broken world? Take a look at the other half. Life is often unfair. Anybody find that to be true? We all do, right? In a broken world, good people struggle, right? Yeah, we've all seen it. And, and sometimes bad people don't. We've seen that too. In a broken world, the good get seriously ill. And sometimes the bad people seemingly never get ill. I, I, I don't want to park on this. But those of you who know me well and know Monica well, in the last year she's had a bunch of cancer surgeries and she's had chemo and heart attack and open heart surgery. And we just found out a little over a week ago they found uh, cancer in her other breast. And so now we're dealing with that, okay? In a broken world, good people get seriously ill. That's just how it goes, okay? By the way, we're going to be okay. Thank you for praying for us. Many of you are. I appreciate that. I don't want to make it sound trite. It's as serious as it sounds, but it's part of life. I'm not sitting here going, God, where are you? By golly, I've been praying now for 18 months, and what I get is a new cancer diagnosis. Thank you very much. You ever think that way or feel that way? Of course we do. But the truth is, in a broken world, good people get seriously ill. In a broken world, sometimes the good people are not healed. And what's even more scary is sometimes the bad people get healed. We've all seen that. It's a broken world. It doesn't work like it's supposed to. In a broken world, the good are sometimes miserable. And the bad are sometimes very comfortable. In a broken world, the good sometimes die young. And the bad sometimes live long. It's a broken world. And last of all, in a broken world, the good are still touched by Satan. He still comes against them. In fact, you could make a case that when people choose to follow Christ, they get more of Satan's attention than those who don't. Okay? So now, our hope was this. Our hope was that if I couple my faith with my obedience, that somehow I get to live this charmed life where I'm like Teflon. Nothing ever sticks to me, right? Here's the truth, okay? Here's how God works. In God's way, our faith plus our spiritual development actually leads not to a charmed life, but to an overcoming life. Wow. That's different, isn't it? It's not God's goal that I would be charmed in life. It's God's goal that no matter what comes against me, I would be victorious. So I want to I skip the next slide. I'm going to go straight to the Romans chapter 8 slide. Okay, 
Well, yeah, let's go back one more. Sorry. One more. There you go. Well, all this means to us is that God is committed to us thriving in life and to our welfare. God is firmly committed to that, but he does not do that by removing trial from your life and making everything fair for you. Okay? Number two, God partners with us to choose a personal plan that suits us. When you go to God, God, what should I do about this? What should I do about that? What should I do about this? What should I do about that? I think oftentimes God goes, put on your big boy pants and make a decision for yourself and I'll walk with you in it. I'm not going to make that decision for you. I will make sure if you're about ready to make a fatal decision, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder and say, are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Number three, God won't make all the decisions in our lives. Number four, he wants us to grow strong and wise and skilled and mature and resilient and to feel fulfilled. If God makes all your decisions, you'll never feel fulfilled in this life. You'll feel like a little child. But as you allow God to show you how to make those decisions, you'll feel fulfilled. And that can't happen if he makes all the decisions for us. And God wants to partner with us as we build our own lives. That's God's way. Now I want to clear up one thing before we go. And it's really important that you know this. Okay? And here it is. God doesn't bring adversity into our lives. I, I love my mother. She's a wonderful woman. She has such great faith. But she just said to me two days ago about Monica's cancer. She said, God knows what we need. We got to trust him with it. I did not push back and say, Mom, what kind of theology is that? But it wasn't good theology. God didn't bring cancer into Monica's life. You see, God takes advantage and leverages the adversities we experience in life to help us build our life, but he doesn't create the adversity for us. So if you get sick, don't shake your fist at heaven and say, God, why would you do this to me? Because more than likely, God's sitting up in heaven going, I had nothing to do with that, dude. <laughs> I don't do that stuff. But now that this adversity has come into your life, if you'll trust me with it, and if you'll walk with me through this adversity, I will make sure that you come out the other side stronger, wiser, more enduring, more loving, more kind, more faithful than you've ever been before. Because you, my friend, will be an overcomer, not someone who's charmed. I want to close by reading us a passage of Scripture. I call it God's guarantee. So here it is. Paul writes, if God is for us, no one can defeat us. You got that? God's for us. So no matter what comes into my life, it'll never defeat me. If I walk through it with God. He goes on to say, he did not spare his own son. By the way, how do you know God's for you? If I could come to your house, I would never do this, but if I could. And I would say to you, I want you to prove your love for me. So I want you to go through your house and I want you to identify the most precious, valuable, deeply treasured thing that you have. Because I'm going to take it. And if you let me take it, I'll know you love me. There might be an awkward moment in there, don't you think? 
Yeah. Paul makes that argument. Look, God did not spare his own son. If you went to heaven and you said, God, show me that you love me. And he said to you, go through heaven, point to anything you want, and I will give it to you. I don't care who it is. And you and I pointed at his one and only son. And we said, God, give me your son. And he said, I will. That's how much God is for you and for me. He goes on to say, so with Jesus, God will surely give us all good things. Can anything separate us from the love Christ has for us? Can troubles or problems or sufferings or hunger or nakedness or danger or even violent death, can anything separate us? In all these things, we are, what are the red words? More than more than charmed, right? No, no, no. More than conquerors. Right. We are overcomers through him who showed his love for us. I've given you a lot of stuff to think about today. I may even have shaken up your theology a little bit. Uh, that's okay. I don't apologize for that. Part of what we ha- we're doing as a church is learning how to think about God correctly, learning how to think about ourselves correctly. That'll get your attention. And in the process, learning how we should be living our lives. And if you have questions about this and you want to talk to me, um, you could call our church office and say, I'd like to make an appointment with Pastor Ron. Because I want all of us to understand how to walk through this life and feel fulfilled and to grow strong and resilient and wise so that our dependence on God is a companionship and not just a dependence. Okay? I want to pray and then we'll set us up for communion. God, thank you so much that you love us enough to tell us the truth about life. Thank you so much for telling us that our world is broken so we can quit trying to expect it to work properly and to be okay with it not working properly because you told us it's not going to. Thank you for promising to be with us in every adversity that comes our way. And thank you for promising that you will walk with us in such a way we come out the other side stronger, wiser, and more resilient than ever before. Help us to understand your way so we can build our lives. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.